we are starting off our morning on an amazing note with a lioness wandering along a game path. She's just had an enormous drink at one of the water holes and now she is setting off to go and search for her pride. We're going to catch up with her and see where she meets up with the rest of them, see if perhaps she calls them. But what an exciting way to start of a morning here in the middle of winter in the African bush in Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains Game Reserve in the Sabi Sand in the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa. My name is Jamie and behind the camera is Viam and this is a Safari Live. spectacular way to start off one's live safari experience in the middle of the African bush. Mr. Hendry is also out with Zander and Brent will be out later on foot with Jandre and Herbert. So we've got a really exciting morning planned for you. Let's catch up with this lioness and find out where she's going. She's calling to the other lionesses that must be somewhere close to Juma Dam. And so off we go on a hunt for lions this morning. Now don't forget, not only are we live, we're also interactive which means that you can send through questions on hashtags on earth.tv and while we are attempting to find this lioness through the dips of the various river systems of Galago and Buyatella oh here she goes never mind I'll tell you what I was going to say in a moment oh she's moving fast on a mission it's a mom She's got suckle marks, so it's one of the Nkumas with young cubs. I'm not sure which one it is. I think it is the mother of the youngest set of cubs, in which case she's probably going straight to Gauri Cup Line, where she's hidden her little ones. What an exciting way to start our morning. What I was going to say was, my apologies, we seem to have a slight, I don't know, cabling something. So my game drive comms are open, so you might hear a bit of chatter between us and the guides just as we manage the sighting. Blah, that was the first thing I looked for to see whether or not could you imagine being a guest on that vehicle by the way how amazing that must feel Tony Blah was looking to see if she had blood on her face perhaps she has a kill somewhere the answer is no she doesn't it was the first thing I checked for it's water so she's covered in muddy water from drinking at Galago Pan so that is what she has on her face but Tony to me she doesn't look there are more coming. The go away birds are calling. The reason we found this lioness, just by the way, was because Zola, the big German short haired pointer that lives next door to us, gave a couple of big woofs. Now, when Zola barks, Zola means there's something there. Because Zola does not bark at anything. So we were, he's the reason that we came and searched this area. The girl, where are you going? Okay, so she's going towards the Boyatella Dam. She's not going to... That's good news for us. It means she's not going to cut through that really tricky block. Okay, we'll catch up with her around the corner. Yeah. Yeah, we've got one more house. She's coming uh, east towards uh, 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 Gary Dam. Eh? This is wonderful. Can't wait to see the reunion with the rest of her pride. Why has oh, she been okay. all on her own? Sometimes I wish we could just well, stay with the lions the entire the time. Okay, so she, 
Aubrey's just telling us that the rest of them are around the Voyatella Lodge. Okay, everybody, hold on. Here's the bumpy bit. Beep, beep. Morning. How are you? We're just going to wait for her to come through. She's going to pop out right here. She's going to... Oh, let's go away, bird. I got excited. Oh, she's coming behind us. You sneaky girl. Okay. She's trying to find the rest of her pride. She has changed direction slightly. And as soon as this lioness disappears from view, we're going to set off. Actually, we're going to set off now and go and catch up with her. But while we do that, let's head over to James Hendry so that he can say good morning. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this end of the Sunrise Safari. It is a marvellous joy to have you with us on the back of our Land Rover. Well, virtually anyway. Uh, my name is James Henry. Zander is on camera. Uh, his beard is looking particularly spruced this morning, and so he's ready to take some great pictures of the amazing things we're going to see out here. That is a young kudu being particularly confiding. Uh, they are just sort of uh, standing here, not running away, which is unusual. And you can see they're all fluffed up because it's a chilly-ish morning, 10 degrees Celsius, 50-odd Fahrenheit. Still got their winter coats. And we do get lots of questions about whether or not animals get winter coats, and they do to a certain extent. Um, they certainly look noticeably fluffier than they will in the 40-degree blaze of December, for example. It's a really nice... Kudu sighting and a very gentle dawn chorus this morning. A dove or two, one or two um, orioles calling. <coughs> a few drongos. <coughs> and otherwise, just a beautiful day that has now started with a golden sunrise, which Zander is going to show you now. Well done, Zander. Brilliant timing. Please do talk to us. We're as live as Jamie is. Hashtag Safari Live. Questions at wildearth.tv. Ask us anything you like about what we're seeing. If we can't answer you, we shall pass your question over to our highly knowledgeable bunch of viewers. And if they can't answer you, well, I'm not sure that anyone can. But we'll do endeavor to research whatever questions you might have. Isn't that lovely? It's a, rather a joy to be able to start off my day every day like that, I must say. All right, our plan this morning is going to be to head along here towards Beefleshook Dam, see what's there, and then we're going to head to Cheetah Plains. I haven't been back there since I returned from leave a few days ago, so that's the plan. Often these things do change as we go along. We find tracks or we find other animals. We'll just see. That's my basic idea for the morning, though. You're welcome to it. Let's go and see what else we can see. I think Jamie's going to probably uh, try and refine that lioness, and it sounds to me like the rest of the pride is around there. So I think a good idea that she lurks about that area, especially with the recalcitrant Wendy. This a new viewer. And then also, out today, we're not alone in the vehicles. Marching about the bush in his large size 11s, I think they are. They may even be bigger than that. The inimitable Brent Leo Smith with his huge stick. And we've just found a lion. Hang on one second. Zunder just spotted a lion while I was yakking away at you. Brent, you'll have to wait one second. Zunder? It just went in that bush. You're a genius. Well done. You are a very, very smart man. There it is. There's a lion there. Two lions, he says. He's trying to 
to contain his to contain his excitement. I wish you could see his face. Well spotted. Brilliant stuff. Two lions, males, I think. Gee, that's a good spot. They're going into a very difficult area, so we'll probably only get a short view of them. There they go. It's that mating pair. That's probably amber eyes. They're just going down there now. There we are. Brilliant. Isn't that nice? So they're heading in a northeasterly direction. They could well cross into the drainage line. I cannot follow them in there, but we will try and relocate them once we get the other side. Stations one male, one female line mobile in an easterly direction f over Gari Cut Line, about mm, only 50 meters to the south of the Biffles Hook Cut Line. I can't follow up, it's too thick. I will go around the other side. So I just had to call that in on the radio, everybody. If you are a new viewer, we're in constant, constant contact with game drives. And there are two game drives around at the moment. Right, let's go and see if we can find those lions again. We're back over to the size 11s and big stick of Brent Leo Smith with Jean Dre and his dreadlocks. Well, good morning and welcome on the Sunrise Safari Bush Walk. James said I had size 11s, they're actually size 12s. But it is a gorgeous winter's morning. And uh, my name is Brent, and I have jean Ray and Herbie with me on foot today. So our plan is we've moved into the area around the southern, southern sections of Juma. And we're going to see if we can find any tracks of Queen Karula. And of course on foot we get a chance to explore lots of tiny little creatures that we might not see from the vehicles. So very exciting. We had a bit of rain, so it could be a few interesting bugs, scorpions or spiders about. So let's get going, see what else is out and about in this winter wonderland. And you see the sun rising up to the east, absolutely gorgeous. There's a mist down in the valleys. <laughs> Good morning, Spiradine. Uh, it says, oh dear, Brent on bushwalk, we're going butterfly hunting. Well, we might just uh, it's going to have to warm up a little bit before the butterflies to wake up, so hopefully before the end of show I can torture jean with a butterfly or five. I like butterflies on this. <laughs> so this is the area that Krula has been frequenting. So we've come right sort of to the western edge of where she's been frequenting. I'm going to work our way through the bush here, heading down to the east, down towards the Moati River. Fingers crossed she's come back from visiting the south. And of course, when walking through the bush, the most important thing you need is a good stick. Oh, quickly across to James. There we are, everybody. We've found them again. They're probably going to cross north into Biffles Hook, which is just in front of us here. Oh, she's calling. Just going to move slightly forward so that Aubrey can have a view. If they cross over this road that we're on now, there, everybody, I'm afraid that will be the last we get to see of them. But she's calling and looking up. Towards the east there, he's also doing that. Well, he's not calling, he's just looking. There, she's calling, she's going, oh, oh. And his sole purpose at the moment is following her. That's all he's doing. There's an elephant, elephant on the road. <laughs> this is fantastic. All right, let's go back to the lions and I think we're going to lose them soon. He 
guess she's calling. Do you hear that? Uh, oh. She's calling now quite loudly. And now lying down. The elephant is totally oblivious to them, or he doesn't care. Bob on. Right. I'm just asking Orb if he can see. So she's calling. Male is looking unimpressed. Elephant couldn't care less. Enjoying his meal. He's in no threat, but elephants don't like. There he is, look at that. And if he was close by, I think he'd chase them. I doubt he's alone either. He looks like he's a fairly young bull. I can hear some others actually. And that's what the male's looking at now. There's some other elephants in there. Hey, what a wonderful start to our morning. And of course we must thank Zander for this first lion spot. You know, while we're just waiting to see what unfolds here, yesterday we had the most amazing elephant sighting and an elephant car came within a foot of the vehicle, which just totally ignored us. And, you know, we kind of, we were asked almost straight after that if we ever get blasé about these things. I said no, you know, it's always a bit of a thrill, but I kind of was answering for Zander and I. And I'd never seen an elephant like that before. And when he got back from drive, well, he was just glowing. Now, the lioness has got up, unfortunately, so he's going to get up too. And he'll follow her. And I think that's going to be it from these two lions, I'm afraid. She's clearly looking for the rest of the prize. Let's move a little forward. Aubrey, of course, will be able to follow them in here. There they go. Let me just move to there. Right, everyone, I'm afraid that's it for us. Isn't that wonderful? Let's go and have a look at the elephants. They're just up the road here. It's a large herd crossing this way into Juma. There's a big herd of elephants here making a large amount of crunching of leaves. But I think it's a big herd. It might just be one ele elephant that's destroying a lot of vegetation. All right, let's quickly go back to Jamie before her lioness disappears. We've got our lioness back once again. She's led us through a tricky spot, but we found our way back onto the road. But strangely enough, she suddenly stopped dead, sniffing and searching around where she is, which is very interesting because she was very determinedly going to the east, and all of a sudden she stopped. She's now looking in totally the opposite direction. I'm just holding on one moment to see where she decides to go. It's over there, girl. I'm relatively certain that this is the female with the youngest set of cubs. If it is, then, and she goes into Gari Cutline, then I'm not going to go trying to follow her into that particular area. First of all, it's a very ecologically sensitive spot. And second of all, with the young cubs, I don't know exactly where they are. Stations. I've got this with Fuzzy and Gala on Gari Cutline, or almost at Gari Cutline. Okay, where is she going? Yeah, she's going to come back this way. That makes more sense. She's looking to meet up with the rest of her pride as well, I think. The female with James was calling. She was calling when we first found her this morning. She's trying to work out exactly where they've all gone. And when she disappears, and if she goes towards where she, we think she's keeping her cubs, 
Vim and I were just discussing that it might be really sensible to backtrack her. Because the rest of the pride has got to be somewhere. Taxon had their tracks going into the direction that she came from, and she does have a full belly. <laughs> and Donna Hall, while our new mum, makes her way slowly towards us. Donna wants to know how many cubs we have in total. Hello, gorgeous. Isn't she beautiful? Donna, there's eight in total. Three youngest ones, two middle ones, and three older ones. This is the mom of the youngest set, I'm relatively certain. Big girl. She's making sure she's not leading anything into her den site. Including us, we won't follow her in. She's right behind our vehicle, we can't move right now. Shamsan, absolutely, she really does look beautiful in this light and in this foliage. She's absolutely gorgeous. You can see she's going into some very, very thick vegetation. This is exactly, almost exactly, where Herbert found her den site. So we're going to let her wander in, but we're not going to try and follow her. So as our lioness disappears into the drainage system to go and feed her babies, let's go back to James, who on this exciting morning has got another iconic animal. It is iconic, everyone, but it is unfortunately missing bits of it, a bit of its trunk and quite a substantial portion, probably about half the trunk there. Now, there seem to be an increasing number of these elephants that are missing their trunks and bits and pieces of their trunks, and I suspect quite strongly that although we try to paint a picture that a lot of the stuff out here that renders animals in difficulty is natural, I suspect many of these trunk injuries are probably from uh, human interventions, and that's likely to be from snares. So... We know that there are two mi four million people living on the boundaries of the Kruger National Park, most of them in abject po poverty, and that means that people go hunting for, not for elephants. It wouldn't have been intentional that it would have been to try and catch something like a, um, an impala to eat to feed the family. And unfortunately, a byproduct of snaring, which is a, it's a particularly cruel way of trying to hunt something, but often the cheapest and easiest way to catch something, well, a byproduct of that would be an elephant that gets its trunk caught in a snare. That said, that elephant, although it looks a bit odd, is surviving, and I've no doubt it will survive. That is not a fresh injury at all, and so I think it will be absolutely fine. And we've seen many, many elephants out here with sort of bits of their trunks missing, and they get by, you know. They drink by sticking their faces into the water, they go down on their knees. There's a big bull who's missing half his trunk, that's how he does it. They manage to browse by pulling over the trees and then just biting the, the, the leaves as opposed to sort of picking them off individually like many of the elephants do. And they just get by.
and eating there, quite interestingly, again, we were discussing the other day um, the eating of less than fresh bush, for example, bush that is, um, well, old leaves that have fallen off the trees. And that elephant is doing precisely that and seems to be enjoying it quite a lot. The elephants are starting to look ropey, as I've said. Their hips are showing, and I think that there are a number of nutritional deficiencies that they're being subjected to right now. Let's just see where they go. I will try and move into a better position. But they're moving because there's also another vehicle coming. They're still inside Biffle's hook. Okay, let me just reverse slightly. How's that? That's right. That little thing staying close to Mum now, a little bit nervous. That's what that foot in the air means. Just fidgeting, displacement behaviour. And you can see the trunk not quite up to being able to pick leaves and break little twigs just yet, although it will be attempted. And I don't know if you heard that, but a fairly loud grumbling sound from, I think, that young bull who crossed the road while the lions were on the road going... I'd love to be able to speak elephant. I'd love to know what they say to each other. I think we're only vaguely beginning to understand some of the communications that elephants have with each other. Hello, Justin S. Um, a nice question from you about whether they will... M we all know that elephants mourn their dead, but will they mourn the dead of elephants that are not related to them? Um, Justin, I think it very much does depend on whether they're related to them or not. I think what you'll find is that um, while they might not mourn a strange elephant, they will certainly, um, they will certainly acknowledge it and they'll go past the bones of a dead elephant that isn't necessarily related and smell them and feel them and so I think it's probably a little bit like um, you know if we go to, if you go to a graveyard for example, my mother loves going to graveyards uh, not modern ones, old ones and you go into those sort of graveyards, historical graveyards and you feel a sense of, of sadness because the, the, you know that there are dead people there and you know, they all had families and there were people that mourned them, but you don't necessarily feel, uh, you don't feel bereft like you would if you lost a family member. And I think it's quite similar with these elephants. I don't think they feel the same sense of, of mourning that they do when they lose one of their own, but absolutely they acknowledge uh, the death of other elephants that aren't necessarily related and that died quite a long time ago. There they are. Hoping they're going to pop out from there. move here because one of them has picked up a very substantial sort of apple leaf tree. Let me just go down here. giving us the, a bit of a, a bit of a stare. And it looks quite like the wrinkly bottomed elephant, but I don't think is because wrinkly bottoms got a bit bigger than this now. <laughs> it's so funny when they do that. I think it's 
going to be quite a warm day, everybody. I fear me winter may have left us. And they're talking, talking, talking to each other. They're all talking now. Just the most perfect light, it's a delicious temperature. And there's another one now walking. Don't worry about that one. The, the half trunk elephant has crossed into Juma just behind us. Here they come. Mark, you say with regard to snares, can the local population of people uh, come onto the reserve and hunt legally? No, they can't. That would be described as poaching. Um, so no, there's no legal hunting on the reserve at all, especially not here because it's private. Well, I mean, it's not anywhere in the Kruger, but it is privately owned land. I'm just going to sneak forward a bit, Zander, and then you can maybe get a slightly better view of this elephant and what it's eating. A small herd, this. I thought it was a much larger herd. But I suppose in the same way as you might say the old adage goes, one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. So you go, one man's poacher is another man's hunter and that's what's going on here it's a tremendously contested space um, con conservation space throughout Africa because of course conservation area is largely a colonial imposition and not born of local people destroying wildlife, but born of the colonialists destroying wildlife. So it does make it a little awkward. And we're nowhere near sorting out the problem yet. In the meantime, however, we'll just enjoy these elephants and their existence in the golden sun. Jamie's lion, I think, has disappeared and she has now had to go back home, unfortunately, because Wendy is a nasty old bat and is not functioning in a post-proper way. Okay, we're going to wait here with these elephants for a little while. Uh, Brent Leo Smith has found something other than his own giant footprints in the sand. Let's go and find out what they are. So it looks like, don't you love it when a good plan comes together? We're right on the southern edge of our Travis area and we have tracks of the Queen Karula coming back into Juma. Unfortunately, no cub tracks, so it's just her. And uh, they're heading in a sort of westerly direction. And so they're heading into this block here. Now, as you said, this is a real favorite area of yours to hunt. Lots of monkey orange thickets. Uh, so lots of stenbok, lots of dica, two of her favorite food species. So we're going to now go very, very slowly. Since that rain, it's made the tracks a little bit difficult. Is Herbie trying to call me? Oh, no, he's talking on the radio. Okay, so we're going to keep moving in on these tracks and hopefully we can add a leopard to the lions you already have. We've just got to go very slowly. You can see how hard the ground is. I mean, if I stand, I barely make a footprint. And I weigh more than double what Karula does. So you've got to know in these situations with tracking, you've got to start thinking like a leopard. So if I was Karula, and this was in front of me, where would I go? 
Now, the problem with Trula is that most leopards will take the obvious main game path through here. Trula sometimes doesn't. So we just got to go very, very carefully. Try to look for any little bits of slightly softer soil. We might just get the inkling of a track. And I mean, we're dealing in little dust scrapes at the moment, so it always pays to just check very, very carefully. So now, we're going to keep checking very, very carefully through here. Try to figure out. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we're back on the tracks. While we follow silently as possible, let's go back to James and that elephant. And silently is not easy with that backpack uh, that Jean Dre is carrying, but I'm sure they'll do their best. Right, here we go. One of our elephant cow, as she's now thinking about coming across the road here, I think, to join the young bull that came across a little while back. And she's feeding on what's called Acacia gerardii, the red thorn. Delicious tree. Uh, the gum is really nice to eat, even for human beings. You just, can you, you can't really see her. I'm going to sneak a little bit forward. Hello, George H. A very nice question from you. You say you're not, you know that we can't hear all of elephants' calls because they are uh, sometimes too low for us to hear. Uh, that's the frequency that's too low. But can we sometimes hear the, feel the vibrations? Yes, absolutely. You can hear the vibrations. You can feel them uh, coursing through your being sometimes when they call. Um, but not all the time. Sometimes I think it's completely silent to us. And, I mean, you, we know that when, for example, they decide to go off to drink. Sometimes you'll be watching a herd of elephants, and they'll be feeding like these ones are feeding. And then, all of a sudden, they stop, they look up, and they start to move. And that's a sign that something's been said by the matriarch, but we just, we just don't hear it. It's too low frequency and possibly too quiet as well. So by low, everybody, often um, it's, it's a difficult thing to sort of understand. By low, we don't mean um, quiet. It's the frequency. It's a, it's, a, it's a low register, like a low note, a bass note, so low that our ears are unable to pick it up. That's what George is talking about. That little thing is being quite amusing. <laughs> that is so cool. We seem to have a private vehicle driving at us at some speed. showing any great signs of slowing down. Let me, um, I'm going to have to move everyone. There we are, we're okay. It's just people going to and from work at the camps. Elephants didn't mind. Well, the little one did a little bit, but he's okay. Cool. It's like Elof Street here. There's another one coming by. That's why they've stopped feeding. They're just waiting to see what's going on here. There we are. All okay. Kelly, you say, did the little one go underneath its mother for protection? That's precisely what it did. It's exactly what it decided to do. 
Just you see the way she's walking there with her head bopping up and down. It's just a not threatening way of walking, but it's a, just a um, it's a it's a kind of body language that says, uh, "Don't get any closer. I'm not that comfortable with you." So we're just going to sit right here. She's only about ten meters from us now. And we have a beautiful shot of an elephant bottom. Sunder, is that the best elephant bottom sighting you've ever had? Yeah. I think it might be. She's also got some very impressive hair on the bottom of her tail there. Salon quality. As opposed to Jandre quality. So just, I was just finishing the question there, yes, go, she, this one's a little bit big to fit underneath mum, probably could if he really wanted to, but certainly will get close to mum if there's ever a feeling of insecurity. certainly still be suckling, although trying to eat some vegetation at the same time. And there they go. And I'm going to cross into Juma. A vicious little bull there. <laughs> Morning Glory, a very good question from you, saying why is it that elephants sometimes strip the leaves from the branches and why is it that they then uh, will, will sometimes break the branches off the trees. Um, I think it's got a lot to do with the species that they're eating and I think it's got a lot to do with whether or not the bark underneath the leaves is worth eating or not. And so, and that will also depend not only on the species of tree but it will depend on, listen to that, it will also depend on what they want to eat, what they feel like they need to eat. I think they're quite selective depending on how they're feeling and what their nutritional status is like. I think it probably also has to do with the shape of the leaves, you know, something like an acacia leaf which is uh, difficult to strip is most likely to be eaten with the twigs attached to it. Something like a, a combretum leaf which is a sort of simple leaf in the manner that you would imagine a leaf to be. I think very simple to strip and so maybe they do that too. I'd rather strip those than eat the branches. Let me sneak slightly forward. I was rather hoping not to have to start the car, but I'm going to have to. In fact, Zander, if you don't mind, just on the top there of the tree, there's a red-billed hornbill. We're just moving the camera. There we are. A yellow billed hornbill, sorry, as evidenced by its yellow bill. And I love the way, I've said this before, I've loved the way hornbills sit out in the sun in the mornings, warming themselves and giving their little songs. <coughs> Many of you will remember Andrew Francis, who used to work for us as a cameraman. He used to <laughs> he used to claim he could talk to the hornbills. And just to keep you posted, the cubs of from the Inkahuma Pride have been found, but they are on Buffalo's Hook, which is where those lions went. And so, unfortunately, we won't be going to have a look at them, but they're safe and sound and on the full hook, and that's why she was calling the lioness. She was going, oh, 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 oh. Isn't that nice? It's a really nice shot. I'm hoping it's going to do its full display. Hmm. 
Isn't that cool? <laughs> so there's only two cubs there on Biffle's Hook. Um, so the others could still be on Juma. And that little hornbill would eventually get up and move, go down, probably try and find some termites to eat at this time of the year. There won't be any fruit for it to eat. It might also find the odd reptile, perhaps a lizard sunning itself in the early morning light, or even a new chameleon, perhaps. But mostly it's just going to warm up after a chilly night. Just appreciate what you've just seen there. I know that it looks like a fairly awkward jump from one branch to the other, but it is a tremendous, tremendous, um, you know, from a human point of view, a feat of coordination to do something like that. It's jumped its whole body height down onto a twig that is less than a few centimeters wide, in fact less than a centimeter wide, so less than a quarter inch, and it's just jumping around on these on these branches seemingly at will, but if you could imagine trying to do the same thing proportionately with our sort of physical capabilities, it would be completely impossible. And the next time you have a bird in your garden, or you watch a bird in a park or something like that, and you watch the way they hop around on the trees, it really is just so impressive. There the elephants go behind it. So there they are going to look for some termites on the termite mound. There we are. Like I say, our, our plans do tend to change quite substantially. And so I'm not sure if we will go to Cheetah Plains. We probably will still. But first we'll go and check out Bifflesook Dam, find out what's going on there. And while we do that, let's head back across to Brent Leo Smith and find out what he has to tell you about his tracking. So we saw a couple of tracks in the block heading in a generally sort of northeastern direction. But I mean, they were just the tiniest little scraps. So we made our way down towards the treehouse waterhole. There's a herd of elephants behind us somewhere. We can hear them. And um, Herbie's just checking up there. We're checking down here quickly. So I'm really hoping we're going to find some nice fresh pug marks out on the softer soil. It's really difficult tracking at the moment. But that's what makes it quite exciting because you're able to test your skills to the absolute limit on the hard soil. Now I'm just going to take a meander down towards where the elephants dig. Hi Justin. Justin's 13 years old and he'd like to know how do I know that they are Karula's tracks. Justin, uh, this is the, one of the core parts of their territory so it's unusual to find another female in this area. The other thing is that I've been looking at Kruda's tracks for over a year and a half now, and they're quite small for a female leopard, so it does help us to discern that. But even Shadow's tracks are a bit bigger than Karula's, and Kanyeni's are much bigger, so Lahesh's are much bigger. And uh, the only other possible leopard it could be in this area, maybe, is Shadow, and uh, her tracks are bigger. So there were no cub tracks, so she's obviously stashed the cub somewhere, and she's out hunting. I just want to go have a quick look down here, see if there's water in any of these little spots. There might be some water down in the main part of the water hole. And if there is, I'm going to check very carefully on the edge, see if she stopped for a drink uh, while she's been out on the hunt. Now, I've found Karula in this area many, many times. So that's why I'm going to talking quite quietly, walking slowly, and you notice I'm looking around. I also very conscious that the elephant's not too far away. Okay, whoopsie. Okay, so here we go. Means the ground's incredibly hard. There's no water here. There is water in the main part of the water hole. And uh so the tired impala, or a piece of one. I wonder if it's Nelson's horn. Uh, I don't think we'll ever know, unfortunately. This horn's a bit small for Nelson. I'm just trying to see. It's very old, this one. 
now. Possibly from a leopard kill. And then it's been stolen by hyenas and moved around. Tingana's killed a male impala not far from here about six, seven months ago. So it could be, it's, it's old, but it's not that old. There's still a bit of meat there. They're very, very cool. I think maybe we should find another one. We can attach them to Jean-Dre's hat. So he has some camouflage as he moves through the bush. Or put it on the aerial, very tall and pilot. Okay, so it grinds it a little bit softer here, but still be quite difficult to find tracks. And there has been an Ellie visiting here, but after the rain, they're probably not going to be as, as serious about digging. Now, they haven't dug down into the water here for a while, but even if I dig a little bit, you can see the color of the soil change. And you can see, so that means the water is not far down there. You see that dark, dark, damp soil. But there is standing water, so I think she's probably going to head towards that. Always pays to check carefully. Now, the one positive here is there's been a lot of hoof action and elephant walking here. So they've softened up the soil. So it gives us a better chance of seeing tracks. Okay. Okay, fingers crossed. We've also just got to hope she was here after the elephants. So, hi, Catty Dean. Cassie Dean says there seems to be, over the last little while, a few males, females, cubs hanging out together. Why do they do this if they're normally solitary animals? Well, the reason is that in that case it was Tingana, Karula, and Shongile and Hasana. And the reason is there was meat there and Tingana was stealing it. Uh, that's, that's the reason they were all together. Now, each different leopard has a different personality. So Mvula seems to be far more tolerant of other leopards than, say, Tengana. So it, it does happen, and nothing is set in stone. And the thing, wonderful thing about animals is whatever they want. They didn't read them. Can you look, Herb? I'm going to head back towards Treehouse Road and carry on east. Okay, so before we move on, uh, let's no, rusty. Hello, everybody again. Um, I'm just sighing there because these water buck were framed so nicely in the light and now they've decided that they are deeply afraid of us and they've walked off just to a position where we cannot see them properly. It is very irritating. Come back here. Come back here. Turn around. No, they're not interested. They've left their lovely smoky leathery smell in the air. And they are very disobedient, as Rebecca is pointing out to me. Now, also on this tree in front of us, which I don't think Zander has spotted yet. <laughs> Zander, there is a squirrel. Got it. You got it. Well done. Good job. There is a tree squirrel sunning himself. 
That's a young one. And I saw an adult coming running down the main trunk as we were trying to get the recalcitrant waterbuck to stop being so pathetically scared of us. And I suspect that was probably the mother of that little one that is just sunning itself there. And I think that little, can you see the knot just to the left hand side there? I'm pretty sure there's a nest in there that the little squirrels live in. Very sweet little things. Now, if I'm not mistaken, and I must, you must ask him to tell you about this for the next time you talk to him. Um, but Steph, who is, for those of you who don't know, is our, basically our general manager, and he also presents very beautifully, wonderful naturalist. But he's got a little son, and they rescued a, um, <laughs> they, they rescued a little squirrel that had fallen out of a nest or something. I don't know how they got it. Anyway, it now lives with them at home, but it keeps biting Steph. So he, while his son is absolutely enamored with the thing, Steph can't wait for it to shake off this mortal coil or be carried off by an African goshawk. Let's hope that this wild version is not taken by an African goshawk. They just really are. You can see why so many uh, sort of nursery rhymes and uh, children's stories have been written about squirrels. You know, very cute indeed. And certainly, I don't think many of you would associate them with rats. And they are rodents. They're quite closely related to your garden variety rat. Just almost closing the eyes there as it's warmed up by the sun. <laughs> That's so cool. All right, we're going to move forward now. We're on a road called Central Road, which isn't interesting so much as it is because we don't know where the other lions are. So we're just going to see if we can't find them through here. We've had three lionesses so far today, uh, two cubs on Buffalo's hook. Where are the others? Don't know. Where are the other Birmingham boys? Don't know that either. So let's go and see if we can find out. Zander, was that squirrel sighting the highlight of your stay so far? Yes. Yes, I thought you might say that. Right here. Now, I'm in two mines. I'm going to go up here. This is Hyena Road. This is where the lions were yesterday. Now, the only reason you would go up to a place, well, there are two reasons that you would go to where the lions were yesterday. Uh, one, if they had kill, or two, if they had youngsters. So lionesses can sometimes be found in the same place if they've got youngsters that they're trying to look after. I'm just going to talk to Herberto on the Game Drive channel. He wishes to speak with me. When Herbert calls, one answers. Herbert, do you copy? I'll turn him on so you can hear him. His dulcet tones. He's not speaking. Herbert, 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 I'm going to moy in. Varewa Wagun Love. Um, from Jeff, we were with this. My father in with Gonzo, crossing north, just slightly east of um, yeah, be talking the quarry on Garamay. Uh, confirm where are you operating? Uh, I'm on Hyena Road at the moment. Okay, um, Hiding, just like the water buck did. We walked the block from the cut line north towards Tree Dam, and we are now on Tree Dam, still looking for the coming house. We're going to check where's nest. We mind to check um, from Shivamo to Tree House. He's just telling me where to go and look for for Karuna. Yeah, I'll make my way down there. I'm just quickly checking Bufferzog Dam, then I'll come down there. Okay, thanks. Because Jamie, of course, who was going to go into that area, is now stricken at the DRC. 
Uh, that, of course, is not the Congo, but the area where we live. All right, let's drive a little bit quick, everyone. You heard Herbie there um, saying quite nice tracks of Karula down to the south of where we are now. I just want to check if those lions and the cubs aren't around here still. Um, only two up top there, so those could be the two younger ones, or it could be those three, one of which uh, we think is probably going to die as a result of a severe injury to the left back leg or even the pelvis. Hold on everybody, this is going to be very uncomfortable. There we are. There we are. Hello Justin S. A common question about rescuing animals and have we ever rescued one? No, um, I have rescued a squirrel once but I've never rescued anything else. Um, and that's just because you don't know A how it's going to turn out and B of course a lion uh, cub very quickly becomes a lion which is something of a terrifying prospect if you do not have the um, if you don't have the facilities to look after them and if there isn't an obvious place where you can put them. So, no, we won't rescue them. Wild dogs are a bit different, cheetah are a bit different because they are so obviously endangered, much easier to find placings for them. And so, you know, endangered species and animals that you can place in, in new homes where they won't just be killed on reintroduction to the wild, well, then we might consider doing that sort of thing. Like with Sindile, I guess. Sindile has been rescued. If you are a new viewer, please just tell us that you're watching. It's lovely to hear from you and to know where you're from. Hashtag Safari Life, questions at wildearth.tv. If you're wondering how on earth people are getting hold of us, well, that's how you do it. And we'll answer your questions in real time. Otherwise, just let us know and we'll give you a shout out that, to acknowledge your enjoyment of the wilderness here with us. I don't see any lions on this road. Luckily, I've got lion spotter in chief Zunder with me today. Watch your heads, everybody. Thorns. I think it was round here yesterday that the lions were. And as I, oh, there are tracks now. Tracks on the road going north. Rina, nice one from you about why the lionesses are scattered today. Why are they not around uh, with the cubs like they were yesterday, lazing with the cubs? Um, I think for a few reasons. Firstly, the cubs are of slightly different ages and there is that injured one. And that means that the lioness with the injured cub may well decide to spend a bit of extra time in one place. They've just eaten that buffalo, so they won't be particularly hungry at the moment. She might try and hang around and see if the little one doesn't recover. There's some impala, which indicates the lions are not around here. Um, then secondly, they do split up every so often. Remember, they don't all have cubs, and so the two that don't have cubs will be moving around, seeing if they can't... Oh, no, I've got tracks going the other way. Well, these are not unfresh. Sunday, you keep an eye on the bush here. Sorry, I will get back to you now. Male going north, that's that way. Female going south, that's obviously the other way. Well, maybe they're not quite as fresh as I thought. But I suspect that she, the lioness with the injured cub, is probably in this drainage system around here. Anyway, we'll keep an eye out. Um, so the, the two that don't have cubs, well, they'll disperse all the time to go and hunt. One of them is, seems to be coming into Estrus, so she might mate with that Birmingham boy who she was walking around with today. And then, of course, there's the one that's got the cubs that are much smaller, and they're only about, what were they, they were about, oof, I don't know, two weeks, two, three weeks old when I left here, so they're just about to join 
the the pride and they'll still be kept slightly away from the pride and she'll be moving to and from them to feed them so that's why the pride will split up slightly no, not much going on here in the way of lions never know you never know could easily be that one of those lionesses that has been found, um, even the one that Jamie had earlier, could have been one of the ones from here yesterday. I just thought it was worth doing a little drive through here to see. And as I keep saying to you, please keep an eye out in the skies for the Wahlberg's Eagle, now the 4th of August, me dad's birthday. So um, please remember to wish him well and just keep your eyes in the sky for the Wahlberg's eagles. The first ones must be coming fairly soon. There is a Nkudu. Did you see the Kudu, Zonda? Two Kudu. Stop running away. One of great courage, the Kudu. The ones we had earlier were very courageous, not these ones there. There we go, that's a nice shot. Very nice. There's some more up ahead, and an impala. Hello, Joanne. See, you say you're in Canada and you're a relatively new viewer and you say you love the show and you love, you love everybody working here. Well, that's very nice that you love everybody working here. I'm not sure I do, um, but, you know, that's just because I'm a recalcitrant sort of a nasty curmudgeon of a person. But thank you, Joanne, for getting hold of us. It's wonderful to hear from you. Now, we've got two quite nice things here. Uh, there's a kudu bull there, youngster. Ooh. He's in full charge, Zander, watch out. He's another one behind there. And there's an impala ram off to the right of that, hanging about with the kudu, relieving himself, obviously. There he is. Very fine specimen. This is, it is absolutely uncanny how this happens. Yes, yes, get on with it. Thank you. Uh, well done. Loving the new green grass here. Now, Zander, if you don't mind going onto that kudu again, I'm going to just sneak a little forward. It's eating lead wood, I think, which is not common to see. Definitely eating a lead wood tree. Quite closely related to many of the red of the bush willow trees that we get here, but um, not commonly eaten. Not sure why. Very, very slow growing indeed. So that scraggly bush will probably be at least a decade or two old. Very nicely lit there by the sun. And you can hear that the dawn chorus, well, it wasn't a very loud one to begin with, but it really is pretty quiet still. And a red-billed oxpecker. Is that red-billed? Is it? Are you on the end of the limb? There we go. No, it's a. It is a red-billed. Yes, I thought it might be yellow-billed, but it is red. 
Looking for delicious ticks to eat. A breakfast of ticks. Mm. Sounds wonderful. Can hear some ground hornbills calling way in the distance. Now, we were talking earlier about the low frequency of the elephant call, and we're looking at an animal that makes a call that's also very low frequency, a kudu, low frequency alarm bark. And in the distance, uh, you won't be able to hear them, but I can hear the ground hornbills calling. Also very low frequency. Now, low frequency sounds travel really well through um, bush. Apparently, that's something to do uh, probably with the larger wavelengths allows them to travel much better through bush and vegetation than high frequency sounds. And so many of the animals out here don't make loud um, sort of high-pitched screams but often sort of very unusually low frequency sounds. There we are. Marvellous. This has continued. Biffles Dam, and then we must head sort of towards where Herbert is with Brent. Let's see if we can't give them a bit of a hand. <laughs> and Dispatch, thank you very much for your comment. You say, it's very kind of you, you say a lot of animals communicate with their dung and with their urine, and maybe the animals are just trying to talk to me. I think that's precisely what's going on. Thank you very much. One more look at this kudu cow who's looking at us very confidingly indeed. And you can see how the light, I'm not sure if you can, but the light really has become very bright indeed very quickly. And I think it is going to be hot today. Hmm. Almost feel summery, doesn't it? Right, I'm not stopping again until we get to Bivelsuk Dam unless we find Cheetah. Right, in the meantime, let us go across to Brent Leo Smith, who has made himself even taller than he was originally. I'm sitting atop a massive termitaria and um, acting like a leopard enjoying the morning sun listening unfortunately my ears can't move around like the big cats can but we didn't find any tracks of cooler crossing out of this area so we're now checking very carefully in here so i'm just taking a few, few a minute or so to sit and listen The wind's picking up, which is making hearing a little bit difficult, but I thought I heard something that way. It might have been my ears playing tricks with me. Of course, I wish I had hearing like a leopard. It would make finding them a lot easier. But, no noise. No sight of anything from atop of my termitaria. So, time to move on. So, what I'm doing now at the moment is thinking like a leopard because we don't have an easy area to track. So, I'm basically moving from big termite mound to big termite mound. big elephant trumpet but there so I did hear something in that direction uh, quite far away but <laughs> upset elephant probably upset at another elephant uh, morning Natasha who's in Ontario and Natasha would like to know what's oh, the hardest thing about tracking and what animals the most difficult to track 
Um, of the cats, I would say leopard, probably female leopard in particular. It's because they're so much lighter that even when they step on slightly hard soil, you barely, barely see a track. And uh, wild dogs are another incredibly difficult animal to track, and that's just because they move so quickly. So even if you have fresh tracks, they can be four kilometers away in a matter of minutes. But I'd say of all the animals on Juma, it's probably Queen Karula. Oh, look there. Uh, just caught something on the ground. A little fork-tailed drongo, you got him? It's zapped off its perch. Oh, waiting for any insect. Now, I'm hoping we might see some insects now that it's warming up a little bit. Oh, there we go. As it warms up, we might get a chance to see some bugs as well. In the cold morning, they were keeping a low profile. And the fork-tailed drongo was sunning itself, enjoying the morning. Now it's warm enough that there's a bit of insect movement. Uh, they're out on the hunt. Oh, there goes someone in the aeroplane you might hear overhead. Now, as a general rule, when I'm walking in the bush, if I hear an aeroplane, I keep still. There's a couple of reasons for this. Of course, it affects my hearing, which uh, makes me listening for elephants or, or other things a little bit more tricky. And uh, you don't want to accidentally bump into something big because there's an elephant, fly uh, an elephant flying. And we don't have Dumbo here, an aeroplane flying overhead. So I'm just going to wait for that aeroplane to move a little bit off because there are elephants around us. So I don't want my hearing compromised. Okay, there we go, quiet enough to move on again. Oh dear, what? What have we here? It's a bit old, a very old excavation, but a very cool excavation nonetheless. And uh, it's quite a tricky one. So what I recommend, uh, let me just have a look over Jean's shoulder so I can see what he's showing you. Oh, my shadow is in the way. Sorry, Jandre. Okay, so yeah, that's the giveaway there. This very long, straight track at the base. So this is very old, probably, well, uh, oh, not over a week, but um, between now and the last rain. And you can actually see this creature. And there's its tail there, its legs there, and then it's dug down into the soil here. And you can see how deep it's dug. See, I guess my radio. But you can see how deep it's dug. So I think this is a, the first morning brain teaser. I'll be very impressed if anyone can let me know what animal has made these tracks. So it's laid down here, its tail's there, and it's dug deep into the soil after some form of creature. So if you know what animal made this track, please let me know questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Okay, that's a really nice one. I'll keep a lookout for a fresh one and maybe it'll be a little bit more distinct. Okay, so always pays. Keep your head up. And stop and listen sort of every 30 or 40 meters. We can't hear anything. We're going to keep looking for the queen of Juma, Karula, the female leopard, and whatever other wonderful little creatures we can find on foot. But it sounds like Jamie, uh, with the help of Vim and Connor, have beaten out the gremlins. So let's go see her. Hello and welcome back onto the back of Wendy. Yes, indeed, we seem to have some problems with Wendy. We think perhaps Wendy and the Gowi repeater are having a little bit of an argument. That is at this point the best explanation that we have, but we seem to be up and running as long as we help the teams look for animals in Voyatella signal range. So we will be keeping ourselves busy looking for lions. I'm very curious as to what's going on here. I'm trying to figure out exactly what our lioness was up to this morning. Why she was around here and where the rest of the lions are. So they found two females, I think one of which was Amber Eyes that you saw this morning with James, one of which might have been the female that we started off our morning with. But um, 
there's still therefore three missing and there's tracks coming our line has sort of done circles this morning so i'm going to jump off and i'll show you the track that i'm looking at i don't know if this is her or if this is the rest of the Inkuhuma pride and why they work it's just one set why she became separated from the rest of the group so if we look here her tracks are here i hope no this is her well it's a female this is a pathetic drawing stick but just to make things a little bit easier in terms of looking at tracks this is a line track the, over here this is the back of its foot and her toes are here now this is the lioness going that way okay that wasn't the best tracing i've ever done but the lioness tracks are going this way oh there's cub tracks look here Look at these tiny little footprints with mommy. Here. One, two, three. Toes. Now, this is the size of a female leopard track. But the toes are much sharper in lion tracks. These are little baby footprints. There's one set here. Huh. Very interesting ones. One adult, one cub, two adults two cubs going straight into that block well we've got some exciting stuff happening because while some of our lions may have crossed out of Juma not all of them have there's two sets of cubs or there's two cubs up on Buffel's Hook in Buffel's Hook which must be the oh no then it can't be okay sorry I'm doing some working out in my head here of the different lions Amber Eyes was with the male the mother of the two cubs that we only recently discovered existed, the mother of the two cubs is the older female. The female that we had this morning was not an older female, but she was definitely a mother. Therefore, she was the mother of the youngest set of cubs by process of elimination because she was not the mother of the oldest set of cubs. I hope you're all keeping track and keeping notes because it's all a little bit complicated. These tracks go straight in to this block here and I'm sure that is where the lioness is with the older three cubs huh. very interesting let's just see exactly where they've gone off the road here well oh, the problem with this particular spot is that there's lots and lots of traffic backwards and forwards I've still got them on either side of me going along the road fresh tracks beautiful tracks right up until they've been obliterated by the passing of vehicles oh how exciting oh and tracks going back but that's okay that we expect oh cub tracks going back <laughs> that's exactly what they're doing Liam says going down the mitre drain why which way are you going, lions? That way, that way. That way. Ooh, which cubs are we tracking here? This is a bit confusing. Look, the tricky thing with tracking cubs, we know the lioness went back in that direction, one of them, so that her tracks are expected. The tricky thing with lion cubs, as we've seen, and one of the reasons why we enjoy watching them, is they're playful. So they scamper up and down and backwards and forwards and round and round in circles leaving a person like myself or whoever else happens to be tracking them with a vague sense of subtle confusion oh look here comes Ephraim let's quickly have a chat with him about how many lionesses and cubs there are morning Ephraim hi guys oh um okay now if the, the Ngala there's two more pimpons and then two more fuzzies and one more daughter because there's my pimpon tracks all over here okay yeah okay thanks cheers okay and we'll just um wait for the next vehicle to come past us much yellow on the back of this vehicle main road sorry everybody we'll just wait for them to come past morning
And that's why it's tricky tracking on this road. Okay, well, I try and work out exactly where these lines have gone and where we should start our search for them. Let's go back to James for an update on the back of Rusty. Hello everybody, male leopard tracks going down this road, so you'll excuse me not looking at you. I don't know when they're from, they don't look particularly fresh. I don't know when the last time someone drove down this road was. Let me see if I can find a nice one to show you. Just trying to think. Tingana, I suppose, could be him. He did come down this way. No. Gone off towards there. Keep looking out there, Zander. We might find a leopard. That would be nice. Let me just look in the tree there. <laughs> Excuse me. Summit got on me nose, summit got on me nose. I just want to quickly look in a tree off to the left hand side of us there and see if there isn't something in it. It looked like there might be, but I think it's my eyes playing tricks. It is indeed my eyes playing tricks. You know, there are tracks of the male leopard going down this road. I think that they are not particularly fresh. I also don't think they're very big, which is quite interesting. So possibly not Tingana, maybe our old pal Sindile. Let's carry on down here, see if they don't pop out further along. I'm not going to call them in because I don't think they're very fresh. And just to remind you all, we are being joined by the grade twos of St. Stithian School in Johannesburg uh, in about, well, probably about three minutes now, maybe two minutes, eight o'clock Central African time. And they're the second grade, what you'd, equivalent of what you'd call second grade in the States. There's a very thick bush here, so I'm going to drive slowly, just in case I've misread those tracks. Definitely something in the air here that is getting in me nose. Ooh, elephants going. You hear them, Zander? They're very cross. Let's go around the way there. There's another road just there. They're, in fact, they're extremely cross. Drive a bit quicker now. Big fight going on. Hold on tight, everyone. Maybe they've spotted a leopard. Just trying to decide now whether we're going to go down the drainage or through. Hang on. They're just up here. Absolutely ballistic. There, it's it's wild dogs. It's wild dogs. Wild dogs, everybody. Wild dogs. They're onto the drainage line. <laughs> right, Zander. Now this is your first big test, my friend. Wild dogs, everybody. Okay, we're going to go straight into the drainage here. Okay, hold on, everybody. Uh, 
Have you got visual there, orbs? There, 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 Diker there. Okay, I'm going down the drainage now. So that's what the elephants were screaming at. And Aubrey can't see them at the moment. He's just in, there he is. They were chasing him. Orbs, I'm in the drainage now, got no visual. Just keep an eye, everybody, both sides of the car. There are the elephants. There are the elephants in front of us there. Um, hello, guys from St. Stithians. You can't believe you've just joined us at the most amazing time. We're on a live safari here. We're in the Kruger Park. My name's James. Zander's on camera. And there's an elephant. And the reason that elephant's looking so cross is that they've just seen some wild dogs somewhere around here. But we don't know where they are. So I'm just listening carefully. The elephant is very cross there. We're just going to move carefully because elephants don't like wild dogs. Wild dogs make them very afraid. You've joined us at just the perfect time. What a great way to start your school day, hey? Even though you are in the middle of Johannesburg, you can join us here in the Kruger National Park. Now, I'm on the radio with my friend Aubrey, who's driving around here, also trying to find the dogs. Orbs come in. I'm just trying to see if he hasn't seen them. So here are the elephants at both sides of the road here. No negative. I've just got the elephants here at the junction with Mamba. They all see how all the elephants are standing in one big group. Now you just watch the ground to see if we can see any tracks and I'll just stop where you can see the elephants now. Well, we don't want to irritate the elephants because the elephants are already afraid because they've seen the wild dogs and we don't really know why they would be afraid of wild dogs. They can't be harmed by wild dogs. But they don't like predators. You know, orbs, they're all standing in one big group here. Just, uh, but I don't know what they're looking at. They're looking towards you. So Aubrey's just telling me in my ear where the wild dogs were, but we don't know where they've gone. But how amazing that we can see the elephants here. So if you want to talk to us, please send us your questions, guys. We'll happily try and answer them for you. Hmm. Hello, Jake. You want to know what my favorite animal is and when we will see it on drive? Well, I don't know when we're going to see it on drive, but my favorite animal is a wild dog. Now, that elephant has just moved out of the drainage line there. This is the drainage line is this dry riverbed we're in, and it's chasing. Well, they're not chasing, but they're moving towards Aubrey, who's just up there also trying to find the wild dogs. Copy, I'll do that. And Oliver, you want to know how long elephants live for? There's another big elephant behind us. Big bull elephant. Let's move it so you can see it. Oliver, they live about 55 to 60 years in this area. <clears throat> All right, we're going to move now. And we're going to try and find these wild dogs. Because wild dogs are the most special things. Hi
endangered, which means there are not many of them around. They headed that way, apparently, Aubrey said. So what we're going to do is drive up this road and see if we don't find them. See if we'll keep watching the floor to see if we can see their footprints. We might be very lucky. And while we're looking, let's go across to see my friend Brent. He is walking, uh, trying to find a leopard on foot. And that's exciting. Welcome to St. Stillians. Uh, my name is Brent. I have Jandre on camera with me, and we're busy tracking a female leopard on foot. So we're moving through the bush. We found her tracks coming through, and oh, we've got Herbie who's wandering around us, making sure everything's safe and also checking for tracks. But this female leopard's got two cubs. A lion roaring. A lion roaring way far away. Oh, well, he's too far away for us to look for. So we're going to keep looking for this leopard. So there's a little river system that runs through here, which is a favorite area for leopards. So we're hoping that she's come into here. Maybe she's caught an impala. Maybe she's put it into the tree. So not only are we looking for the footprints on the ground, we're looking up into the tree to see if she's put any animals in the tree. He has a nice big elephant path, and that's always a good place to look for tracks. But it doesn't look like she came this way. But the nice thing about being on foot as well is we're able to look at lots of other things like dung and uh, trees and bugs and spiders. But we've got to be quite careful when we walk. So I'm always listening. Yeah, I'm listening for elephant. I'm listening for buffalo. So, hi Jack. Jack's wondering in what specific part of the game farm we're on now. Well, we're on the southern sections of Juma. James is in the north, uh, or the north, the centre heading northeast, and Jamie, I think, is way in the northwest. So this female leopard, she likes this area. She lives around here a lot, so that's why we're checking here. Just got to go very carefully. Now Herbie's also looking. If I can hear elephants, but they are quite far away. Hi, Holly. Uh, Holly is wondering, what is the most dangerous animal on foot? Uh, Holly, it's probably elephant or buffalo, or the most, or hippo, actually, especially in a drought like this. Uh, hippo might not have water, so it might be sleeping in thick bush, and you might surprise it. But elephant, hippo, and buffalo, I think, there we go. You see the elephants around there? I think it's an elephant. Let me just double check through some thick bush. Yep, there's a big herd of elephants there. I can see about five or six. And they've got babies. So that's not where we're going to go. And uh, we're going to avoid that area. It's very thick bush there. So we don't want to surprise the elephants in thick bush. And that's why I say your ears are very important when you're walking to keep you safe. Also, it's quite a windy day, and I'm sure those elephants heard the other elephants that were upset with those wild dogs, and those elephants were screaming. These elephants would have definitely heard that. So we're not going to go closer to them. We're going to let them move off. And it looks like they might come towards us. So we're going to have to scoot down this way. Sometimes it's safe to walk into elephants, specifically if it's a, a nice big bull by himself. Uh, but when you've got females with babies and we're in the middle of a drought, it's quite, it, it can be quite dangerous. So we don't want to upset the elephants. So we're just going to move along. I think, has Herbie found something there? Looks like he might have. Let's go have a look. Welcome 
on a very exciting live safari. Well, my name is Jamie, and I have a man behind the camera called Viam, who's quite camera shy, but you might see his thumb every now and again. So, what an exciting time we have this morning. Potentially wild dogs running around, one of our favorite animals. Brent's got elephants on foot, and we've been looking for lions all morning. Actually, we found a lion but she disappeared off into some really, really thick vegetation, so we're going to be keeping an eye out for her as well. But because James is busy looking for wild dogs, and wild dogs move really, really quickly, generally at this time of the day, the lions will be sleeping, so we'll come back and look for the lions. But first, we're going to go and help James out in terms of searching for those wild dogs. So I hope you're all hanging on tight on the back here, so that we don't fall off because we're going to be going very, very fast. Imagine the cold air streaming past you. Let us go and find all the exciting things that we can. And hello to Michael and good morning. Michael wants to know what animals we could hope to see on the drive. Michael, as I said, there's definitely lions wandering about, so we're going to be looking for them. Wild dogs are some of the most exciting creatures you can see. Elephants, obviously, because Brent had some elephants. And then we've got all of the different animal species. So buffalo, uh, leopards, cheetah sometimes, antelope, zebra, giraffe. All of the animals that you've seen on documentaries about South Africa. I'm not sure how many of you have been to the Kruger National Park. So hands up if you've been to the Kruger National Park. And for those of you who have, we are basically part of that game reserve. So there's no fences between us and the Kruger, which means all of the different animals can come wandering through backwards and forwards. Where are they all hiding? I see that. Well, we've got lion tracks everywhere. I'm going to try to find you a nice one to show you. And while we do, Taylor wants to know why the female lions do all of the hunting. Well, Taylor, there's a couple of things. One is that male lions are actually, they do actually do some hunting. They're quite good at catching their own food when they have to. However, because they're so big, they're much, much bigger than the females and they've got those big, thick manes. You know how hot it gets here in summer. Well, for the big male lions, they actually sometimes get too hot. Though it's easier for the females, they're a lot more agile. They don't get as hot as quickly. Ah, these tracks have been driven over. I'm trying to find you a nice track so I can show you what a lion footprint looks like. Let's keep trying. The wonderful thing about these lions, of course, is that they've got cubs as well. So there's baby lions around this area. So, Taylor, mostly it's because the males are big and they can steal the food as well. But it does bring us back to Sakile's question, why do the females not have a mane? As I said, that big furry mane around their heads makes them really, really hot. I'm going to keep looking for these lion tracks, but we're also going to keep going this way to help with the wild dog search. So the big mane makes lions very hot. The male lions get hot, it's heavy, and it's uncomfortable. But they need it because male lions do more fighting than the females. Male lions have a very difficult life. They have to fight with other males to establish a territory and then to be able to mate with the females to pass on their genes, or their genetics, and have babies. And the mane protects the most sensitive areas. So the neck, around the neck, around the top of the head, the back of the neck where the spine is, so that another male lion can't bite them and hurt them there. And the bigger the mane, the more impressive the male looks to the females as well. So basically a mane is there to make a male lion look very impressive, but also to protect him like armor. And there you go, Catherine. No, daddy lions are not lazy. They've got other things that they need to do. So whilst the females can spend time hunting and looking after their babies in a certain area, they don't really have to worry about other lions coming in. But daddy lions have a really, really important job to do. What they've got to do is walk all around. Imagine walking 20 kilometers every single day, except they do it at night when it's not too hot, walking around, marking their territory by scraping their feet and urinating on the bushes. They've got to make sure that they are properly in place so that no other male lions come in because if a male lion comes into a territory that's not his own and he finds babies that are not his own then he will kill them 
So the daddy lion has a really important job to do in terms of protecting his babies and his females. So that's what daddy lions do. They're not lazy, but they are, and they also, when they're away from the females, they'll hunt for themselves as well. It's only when the females are there that they kill something and then the males come in and eat with them. But they're more than capable of ki catching their own food. And because daddy lions are so, have such difficult lives, they actually live shorter than the mommy lions. Which brings us to Ryan's question. Good morning, Ryan. I hope you're having fun on safari. Ryan wants to know, how long do lions live? So lions are kind of like big dogs. Those of you who've got big dogs as pets, a male lion usually lives between 10 to 12 years old, whereas the females will live a little bit longer, and they will live up to, sometimes even up to 15, 16, but usually around 13 or 14. I'm going to go and help search for the wild dogs and the lions and all the things we can see, but let's go back to James, who has found the smallest of our carnivores. Hello everybody. Look with there. We've got not quite wild dogs, but you know they have a very similar what we call social structure. And that means that the dwarf mongoose troop is led by a alpha female, that means a lead female, and an alpha male, a lead male. And that's how they live in exactly the same way as a wild dog pack does. Now those little mongoose, everyone, are about the size of sort of rats really, but they're not related to rats. They're actually more closely related to a lion, if you can believe it, than they are to a rat. So they're quite closely related to your house cat as well. Only three of them, and they live in that little termite mound there. Where it's nice and warm at night, and then they can come out when it's a little bit cold still in the morning. And you know how when you guys get to school and you go outside in the winter time, especially now, the first thing you do is go and find a little patch of sun on the field or something like that. It's exactly what those mongoose are doing. They're just finding some sun because although it looks quite bright out here, it's not very warm yet. And so those mongoose are just trying to warm up a little bit in the sun after a cold night. Go ahead, Orbs. I'm just talking to my friend Aubrey. Okay, copy. Confirm quite close to the Mulwati. Yeah, I copied that. Sorry, I did see those. That's the one that I saw there. I just didn't see where they were going. Okay, so now these wild dogs, everybody, have gone to the south of where we are now. We are going to go back towards the south uh, where those dogs have headed. I missed exactly where the tracks were going. So let's go down there and see if we don't, don't get lucky. We might be very lucky, we might not. Hello Jake and St. Stithians. You want to know the big five are found in this park? Jake, they are, but you know, I really think the big five is a very horrible term and I don't like using it at all, Jake, and I'll tell you why. That's because the big five are... It's a term used by people who used to shoot animals and they were the guy. They were the animals that were the most dangerous to shoot. So something, uh, the big five: a lion, buffalo, elephant, rhino, and I'm leaving one out: leopard. And there's so many hundreds of wonderful, amazing animals that aren't part of the big five. And because of these, the, we use this word, the big five. We ignore them. Things like giraffe and cheetah and wild dog. They're not part of the Big Five, but I think they're much more entertaining than some of the animals in the Big Five. And so I don't use the word Big Five anymore, Jake, and I'm hoping that many people uh, will stop to use it because I think it's a really bad term. Right, we're going to continue down here and see if we don't get quite lucky with those wild dogs. But they do move so very fast up and down trying to find something nice to eat. We can drive quite quickly down through here. 
Hello, Zach. You want to know about meerkats and how they grip with their feet? Well, Zach, um, meerkats are closely related to those mongoose that we saw there, but they don't, we don't find meerkats here in the Kruger Park, only up in the Kalahari where it's very dry. Um, and they grip with their feet in the same way that the dog grips with its feet. They've got uh, normal paws and they've got claws, and that's how they move. Remember, they don't climb very well, meerkats. They don't have to climb too well because they don't live where there are lots of trees. Ooh, look. Look at all those squirrels up there on the top of the tree. Two little squirrels. Isn't that amazing? All right, we're going to go back to Jamie now. She's got some impala to show you. I'm going to go quite quickly to see if I can't find those wild dogs. And again, a warm welcome to the boys and girls at St. Stidians. I hope that you are having a lot of fun on your safari experience. And we've stopped now for a herd of male impala. This is the most common antelope that we see out here. That doesn't mean that we must just dismiss them or ignore them. They're amazing animals. Very, very fast. Faster than a lion at times. And they can actually run for much, much further. Because they don't get as hot. So I know it's a male because he's got horns. And like the male lion, we were talking about why a male lion has, mane, has a mane. That's why our male antelope have horns so that they can fight with other males for the ladies, for the females. I've stopped here because I want to see what these impala are doing, if they look scared or if they are relaxed. And impala are on most of the predators menu, so the wild dogs James has been searching for, the lions that we've been looking for, the leopards. That brings us to Kane's question. Kane wants to know what kind of buck is a lion's favorite food. Well, Cain, lions aren't too fussy, but it depends on how many lions there are. Because if there's lots and lots of lions, then one small impala doesn't really make them feel very full. It's kind of like only eating a little bit of food for a lion. But if, if they find something like a buffalo, and there's lots of lions, then it's worth putting in the effort to try and catch that buffalo, because then they know they've got a meal for a whole two days. But one known lioness would definitely try and catch an impala. So it just depends on how many lions there are. They're not picky. They don't have a preference. If they see an impala in front of them, they will try and catch it. If they see a wildebeest in front of them, they will try and catch it. The one thing lions don't try and catch is the little buck. So Stienbock, tiny, tiny little things. Dacre, they won't bother trying to catch them because they're very, very fast and it doesn't really feed them at all. So they don't generally bother with the tiny antelope. Never say never though. The animals don't read the textbooks, so sometimes they do strange and unexpected things. And welcome, welcome to Anouk. Anouk wants to know what we love about being a safari guide. So we guide people around, that's why we call safari guides. We take people on a journey through the African bush and we get to tell them a little bit about the animals, but we also get to spend a lot of time with the animals. And look, it's really hard to choose what the best thing is about being a safari guide. There are so many wonderful moments that we have. But if I had to pick just one, I think I would say the fact that no day is ever the same. It's never boring. There's always something different happening, something exciting happening. So most people, when they get up in the morning, they know they're going to go into their car, they're going to drive to work, they're going to sit and do their work, and then they're going to go home at the end of the day. We wake up in the morning and we go, hmm, wonder if we'll find a lion or a leopard or an elephant or a snake. What will we find today? Yesterday afternoon, when we got home after our morning drive, I went to go and change into some comfortable clothes and... I watched a snake crawl through my window. So that's each and every day is totally different. Now this is another really useful p animal to look for when you're out in the bush. You, many of you will recognize them, you've all seen them. The grey luries or grey go away birds. And you've heard them in your garden going quee, quee, or maybe at your school, definitely at your school, you would have seen these particular birds. 
The reason I'm telling you that they're useful here is because they're very, very sharp-eyed. They're always looking around them. And if they spot a predator, whether it's a, an eagle or a snake or a lion or a leopard, off they go. They will tell us by shouting that queen call. And that's why they're called go-away birds, because they sound like they're saying, go away. Oi! Let's all hear your best go-away bird impression. Oi! Now, Zach has obviously been around places in this area and seen the beautiful, beautiful trees that we call the fever trees. They've got that bright yellow bark, and funnily enough, Zach, that's one of my absolute favorite trees. But Zach wants to know why they help with a fever. And Zach, they don't, actually. They're a type of acacia tree, so with their big, long thorns. The reason that they're called fever trees is because when people first started exploring this area, because all of the fever trees in Johannesburg are planted, they didn't used to be there. But they do naturally occur here. And when people first started exploring this place, they started getting malaria and sleeping sickness from the mosquitoes and the tsetse flies. But they thought it was the trees, because the trees grow around water, which is, of course, where the mosquitoes breed, and that's how malaria is part of mosquitoes. It's before, but now this place to live in, but this was before the, it was, and there was lots and lots of malaria around. And that's why they called it fever trees, because whenever they came to the, the places with these big trees, all of a sudden they would get high temperatures and get very, very sick, which is the the main symptom of malaria is having a really bad temperature or a fever. So that's why fever trees are called fever. It's not because they it's not because they help make you better. There are trees though that will help to make you better. So let's find one for you. Let's find a good example. Oh now they're all hiding from me. Trees can't hide. I'm just in the wrong place for the trees I'm looking for. I'm looking to find a tree that you could use as medicine. And there's lots and lots of different types out here, and they get used for different types of medicine. Now, there we go. For example, the big marula tree that's in front of me. Many of you will have heard of marula trees and the famous marula fruit that they have. This is a marula tree, and whilst it doesn't work for fever, if you get something really itchy on your skin, then you've got to strip the bark. So you pull the bark away from the wood and you make it in, you soak it in water, or you even just rub it straight on your skin and it will help you with the itches. Or maybe you've touched a hairy caterpillar or you've walked through a tree that's made you itchy, the marula tree will help you. And Frida, talking about different animals and getting sick out in the bush, Frida wants to know why crocodiles never ever get sick. It's a really, really good question and the answer is nobody really knows why crocodiles are so healthy. They, as, as you may know, they're one of the oldest animal species out here. So they've been the same, in the same form for hundreds of thousands of years. They have looked exactly the same as they do now. And it seems to be that something perfect in their design, in their biology, that means that they don't ever get sick. They can even eat rotten meat without throwing up. But so can lions and hyenas because their bodies are built and evolved for that sort of thing. And a lot of the animals out here make us as human beings look kind of weak and sickly because they don't get infections badly. They heal up from broken bones without going to the doctor. They can eat rotten meat and still be absolutely fine. All of these things that human beings can't do, the animals out here can. And that's why they are so amazing. Oh, it's wonderful driving around out here and looking at all of the things from the vehicle, but it's equally special exploring the bush on foot. Let's go and find out why Brent is up a termite mound. So we had to actually uh, put some speed in our walk, and uh, we're not sure whether the elephants were upset at wild dogs or maybe even that leopard we're tracking, but because you have angry elephants and you don't want to be any an angry elephant who's got a, a baby with, so we moved out. Herbie's found something down there. I'm not quite sure what it is. I can't hear, so let's go have a look. What'd you find, Herb?
What have we got? Ooh, nice. Now, before we show you this, oh, there we go. John's going to show you. The little burrowing cricket. Oh, he's trying to hide. Shame, he doesn't like to be out in the open. So we will, there we go, come on, little fella. So I, this is a, a little burrowing cricket or a mole cricket. So they, they're incredible, incredible diggers. Oh, Johnny, come look at this, he's got parasites on him. So you see the little orange, orange spot? Oh, but quickly, away from a cricket to a wild dog. This is unbelievable, everybody. There are the wild dogs. Can you believe they've just killed something here? They've just killed a little steenbok, I think. Now, I know that doesn't look very nice, everybody, but don't worry about it. It's dead. It's just like you having a nice steak meal. They've, it didn't feel any pain when it died. And now it is feeding one of the most endangered species in all of Africa. Isn't that spectacular? Oh, wow. We're so, so lucky to see this, everybody. Just want to quickly call my friend Aubrey and see if he can't come in here. Orbs, do you copy? Can't believe how lucky we are to have this amazing sighting here. Took us a little while, but there we are. These are like the big wolves of Africa. And just where I first saw you with those elephants, they must have crossed and come down here and they ran through the bush and then they would have run into the Simpala or Stienbok. I can't actually see what they've killed. And they would have killed it quickly. And there it is. It's a Nyala. You can see now it's a female Nyala. Anyway, I know sometimes it can be difficult to see this sort of thing because we don't like to see things die but everything has to eat and it's important especially you know next time you have a braai or you have a uh, uh, some meat just remember that something had to die to feed you and it's the same thing in this with these predators out here Aubrey do you copy Aubrey yeah come straight Orbs it's great here um, guys at school, I'm afraid you're going to have to go back to your classes now. We're going to carry on sitting here, and I hope you have a wonderful day, and thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Exciting. I'm just going to try everybody to help. It's a bit of a mess because it's on a bound. It's on a boundary, so there are about seventy-six thousand people descending on the sighting. I just so it's going to be a little bit complicated for me. Gert, come around to Twin Dams and come in from Twin Dams into the Mulwati. There's space for three vehicles here. So this is what happens, I'm afraid, everyone, when we have these uh, sightings, when they're close to a boundary. Um, we're all on different radio channels, and people just basically, I'm afraid, behave like a bit of a free-for-all. And that's not, it's actually not a criticism, it's just simply because, you know, we're on a boundary, so it's very difficult to control who comes in and who doesn't. But I don't believe these wild dogs are being affected negatively at all. Everybody has behaved correctly. It's just quite difficult to control at all. But we're over here and seemingly alone, which is <laughs> just wonderful. 
And of course, without all of the vehicle activity around here, we'd never be able to find all of these animals because, well, the area is just too, too big. <sighs> now, Aretas Fox, a good one from you. Who are these dogs, basically? You're saying, do I think they've broken up from the main pack? Um, I think this is the main pack. Now, if these are the same three we've been seeing, Brent took some photographs, sent them through to Grant, who is the sort of resident wild dog expert. I'm just going to sneak slightly forward so that I can give Aubrey a space to see them. Um, Aretas Fox, we think that they are survivors. Three survivors from what was known as the Lower Sabi pack, the pack that was decimated by canine distemper. And we think that's who these dogs are. Isn't it beautiful? What an amazing privilege this is. That's not fighting, it's just playing. Oh, this is incredible. What am I not doing with my camera? This is just brilliant. Hey? <laughs> Believe how lucky we are here. run away from us doggies, stay. They're just having a bit of fun here, isn't this wonderful? Autumn, you want to know how often they have to eat? Autumn, they will eat very often, probably twice a day in many, many cases. Oh, I can't, I mean, they just killed this now, now. They, uh, you know, the three of them will probably not eat again today. You know, but with the big pack, if they kill something like this, they definitely will eat more than once. so lucky. Just stunning. Now, they'll, I suspect they'll probably stay around here. Oh, don't go away. Come on, stay here. They might die that they want to have something to drink. A little bit uneasy. I don't know why. Where are they going? They can see something. Or they can hear something. I don't think they'll I don't think they'll leave this meat here. I'm pretty sure they'll come back here. found something there. Hello, Moin Nudden. You're a new viewer. from to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. You say, where do wild dogs live? In open places 
or in um, or more hidden. Oh, there's the, they've left. You know what it looks like they've left there? It looks like the stomach contents. Um, they live in what we ideally sort of in savanna, I guess. And we're in what we call here woodland, but they don't mind the woodland. I'm just trying to turn around here. I, they've left quite a lot of the kill there. Uh, they've left the stomach contents on top there. I don't know where they've gone. Davoya. All right. Daringet Ale. Yeah. So stomach contents were up there. They had a bite and now they've headed across there, possibly for the water to drink. So I'm going to drive very quickly to get round there. Franklin in the Franklin, move out if you value your life. There is some water in Twin Dams here. They might be thirsty. Last station, go again. Sorry, everybody. they gone and why have they left food? That is very odd. There, they're on the damn wall. There we are. Beautiful. Isn't that special? Let's just wait here for them. Gert and Aubrey, they're on Twin Dam's wall. Oh, wow. We are so lucky. surprised this behavior though I don't really understand why it is that they are why they'd leave their food there doesn't make sense to me so let's just wait and see what happens here they're calling listen listen others. That is absolutely astounding. Did you hear that? <laughs> Bizarre sound. Almost like they're looking for the others, but I would have thought this pack was only three. Maybe it isn't. Maybe this isn't who we think they are, and maybe they're looking for the rest of the pack. That would explain why they left a little bit of the food there. Now, let's... We're just going to wait here and see what they do, everyone. hear anything else coming out of the north. And Rena, you want to know if we can tell how many male and female we have here. I'll tell you right now. As far as I understand it, there are two males and one female. Yeah, I think that's the case. Two males in front there and one female behind. That's the female who's just turned towards us now. Don't go south. We 
they go south, they go south, that's to the left of your screen, everyone. If they go there, then we're going to lose them, because they'll go down into another reserve. And Chris Applegate, you've heard them making that very strange noise, and you want to know if wild dogs bark. Um, they can. They can make a sort of loud alarm bark, but they don't bark by default. That sound you heard is much more common. There we go. Come north, chaps. Uh, but it's more not the most common sound they make, Chris, is to is, is like a chirruping bird sound almost when they're excited and they're looking at each other or looking to sort of beg from each other and when they're communicating. They can hear something going on up north there. And it's either making them nervous or it's making them curious. Now what's interesting is that their hunting efficiency is so well they hunt with relative ease. And that's why they're prepared to leave that bit of food there. I cannot imagine another predator leaving that much left to eat and just leave, you know, just disappearing off. Yeah, oh, I think there's something making them nervous up north. Now oh, I can hear I just heard a ooh, ooh, ooh. Here we go. I heard that from way up north. Now whether it was a bird or another dog calling, I don't know. It's going again. I can hear it again. about going south, but they're in two minds. Gosh, we're lucky. Now, going off to the south. Now that's it, everyone, I'm afraid. now. We'll move a little bit down. I'm going to move down off the bank. They might go back to that kill, you know. It's not far from here. It's just over the back of the damn wall. And the Batelier Eagle about to go and land on that carcass. We'll go back to the carcass just now. So that will not be left to waste. There's one male still on the damn wall thinking about staying. And Jeanette, you're wondering if wild dogs are related to hyenas. They are not. They are not. Um, they're less, much more closely related to jackals. Hyenas much more closely related actually to mongoose and then to cats than they are to the dogs. So foxes and jackals is what wild dogs are most closely related to. They're yeah, having a drink down there. Quick drink down in the puddle. Now coming back north, the others are coming back north. We need to go down there. They might all have a nice drink. Beautiful 
yeah. Look at that. This is amazing. Oh, this is amazing. And like I say, there are bateliers flying all over the place. Oh, there we go. And the smell is so amazing. Can you smell them, Zunder? They smell like wet dogs, which is, of course, what they are. And then I, that, I think, is going to be it, everyone. They're now going towards the south. But they might go back to that kill. But I think we'll go back. we will certainly go back to the kill and see if the batelier don't go and try and eat it, which will be amazing to watch. There they go. They're heading off to the south. And so I think we're going to probably have to leave them there. But I'm going to go round in the Mulwati drainage and just go back to the kill site and see if they don't maybe go back there which will be wonderful. Lauren, you want to know about domestication of wild dogs? No, no one's ever domesticated them. You can raise them from pups, but what happens, Lauren, is that they, they start to wander, apparently. They don't like, um, they can't deal with it. Sorry, Jamie's just calling me. Go, Jamie. Affirmative. I'm about to go into the Mulwati to the kill site. Just going to let these guys go past us because they haven't seen any of them yet. Seen any of them yet. Yeah, that sounds like he thinks is around up there, up where she is, in the far west. She can hear um, Impala alarm calling and she can hear them calling. So I wonder if that isn't what's there. She was... Okay, well, we're going to leave them now, everybody. We're going to leave them to the three... So we're going to... Oh, exciting things are happening here. We do apologize for James's signal that seems to be struggling in the Mulati drainage, as you know, bringing you live safaris from the center of the African bush. In, in count, we encounter problems every now and again. Right, so an update from our side. James's wild dogs are obviously behaving in an interesting manner. So are the animals here. We're around the Gauri repeater. I've just done a quick check there. All is in order. As I said, Wendy and Gary not really talking to each other right now. But we had Kudu alarm calling bah once. That's all she did. She went bah. And the. Let's go back to James and the kill. Look at this, everybody. Check out these vultures. They've come down. Look at them pounding out of the sky. This is so amazing. Hundreds of them. Scrabbling over this Nyala. There'll be nothing left here very, very soon. Try and count them coming in. Look at them all. Wow, this is fantastic. This is truly, um, I mean, this is astonishing. Now, it sounds to me quite a lot like Jamie might have the rest of the pack up where she is. A loud calling. Look at them go. They just got a bit of a fright because a vehicle came in, but they'll come straight back. They'll come straight back. Oh, this is amazing. We are really lucky today. They're coming in from all angles, everyone, and they follow each other in.
all white-backed vultures so far, no other species. I think Jamie's got a good idea there. I think it might well be that the rest of the pack is up somewhere to the north of us. You can hear the ripping sound that the vultures are making there. It's just fantastic. Ewes. Also, them sort of scrabbling around on the ground, and there are two lots of vultures here. Some of them eating the rest of the carcass that they left, and then others that have gone towards the stomach contents <coughs> on the other side. Just, Zander, if you don't mind, can you go up? Just look at the all coming in here. <laughs> you won't believe what I just saw. One of them fell out of a tree, tried to catch up or catch on with its long neck and then it plummeted out and just managed to kind of take flight. Look at them all coming in. And there's not a lot to eat here, everybody. This will all be gone in seconds, or in certainly in minutes. And by the time it's gone, all these, a lot of these vultures will just sit here in the trees. And so if you were to come by here and you didn't know what had happened, you'd assume that something had died here. <clears throat> oh, that's just brilliant. Huh. And now everything's kind of gone to peace. Sorry, when we first, that first bird we saw, I think just before you lost us, I thought it was a tawny, um, a Wahlbergs, it wasn't, it was a tawny, definitely. And the tawny and the batelier that would have swooped in here would have led these vultures to this kill. And then they would have had to fly off the batelier and the tawny because they will not compete with much big white-backed vultures. Amber, you want to know how fast they'll be able to eat this before it's all gone. I don't think this will last more than half an hour. And then I think it'll all be done. There'll just be a few bones left. And something's coming in and giving them a fright. A lot of them have just taken off. Not sure what that would have been. Not see anything around here. No vehicles have come in. Just fantastic stuff. Wonderful light. Sally, in Oregon, of course, we don't often see this sort of thing, and you're saying, is it normal for the vultures to behave like this? Absolutely, completely normal. We just don't often see them like this, and I think that's because there aren't that many of them around anymore, but yes, completely, they will fight over each other, they scrap, they make that hissing noise at each other, and they'll go off and try and find some, um, they'll try and find some, some water a bit later, Seriously lucky today. <laughs> Here comes another one, landing in the trees. And I think what they do now is they arrive, you see, and they see that it's not a big buffalo, that it's pretty much just about done. And then I think they probably 
to the side. Ugh. Let's move on. Jeff, very good question from you. You want to know how they would have spotted this kill? Jeff, they would have spotted it by, I think, probably following the battalier in. So, the first of all, I don't know if you remember when we were watching the, uh, the wild dogs on the dam wall, I said, there's a battalier, and I'm not sure if we actually managed to see it because I was concentrating on three and a half thousand other things. But they will follow battalier. Battalier are scavenging birds and these vultures will absolutely follow the battaliers. So could have followed them. Otherwise it's just, I mean it's now nine o'clock in the morning so there's a little bit of heat coming off the ground so the vultures will try and start to find thermals. One or two of them may have spotted it first and then the rest who are extremely keen-eyed would have seen them descending and as soon as they watch other birds going down onto the ground, other scavenging birds then they come at 100 miles an hour and that's what would have happened now of course all of the vultures in this area probably within i mean i'm going to say up to a hundred kilometer radius of this area if they were looking around this maybe not quite say 50 kilometer radius of this area they would have seen these vultures coming down and they would have come straight here You can see half of them have given up already. Not much else to eat. Just the biggest ones still managing to feed. Yep. How cool is that? Michael, you want to know if birds have hierarchies um, like this. Birds like this have hierarchies at these kills. Absolutely they do, Michael. Um, but that's, it's not, it's born of size entirely. And these guys are, are dominant by number, but when the lappet-faced vulture, which is not a very common vulture, comes into an area like this, then uh, they dominate completely. See, it's done, it's finished. Now they'll stand around a bit decide if they want to fly or not. And then we'll see. Well, some of them will, if those that haven't eaten properly will sort of take off into the sky and try and find something else to eat, and others will probably just sit in the dead tree above here. Let me just catch my breath a second. Let's head across to Brent on the bushwalk and see what's going on there. So we had to move out of that area where we were earlier. There was just too many elephants and they were angry in this wind. So what we're going to do now is we've popped into camp, grabbed the camera trap and then walked out from camp again. Now here is a massive game trail that comes at the confluence of about five or six game trails a bit further up. And there's this ideal expired leadwood stump right here. The Gallego waterhole is probably about mm, 50 meters. I can just make it out through there. So we're going to pop the trap up here. Now, I did pop it up, and we got porcupine on the other one. I will start sharing some of that stuff. It is. There are over a 1,000 uh, little videos to sort through. So I've done all the setup. So we're streamlining this. There we go. It's on into its hyena proofing. Just how we're going to put it shortly, and we're just going to use this cable tie to extend the oopsie reach, and that should be spot on there. Oh, this is where it gets a bit more tricky. No, I, I think I had it in a slightly higher spot when I was testing. 
but this was a good place. Oh, hang on. <laughs> and that's just remove a bit of bark to make it a bit skinnier. Oh, and we've got some stuff to look at once we're done. <laughs> okay, so there we go. That should be much easier. There we go. So, let's, we're going to do some rearranging in front. Let's turn that the right way around. How does that look to you, Jandre? That looks like it's going to hit the spot down the game path. Okay, let's tuck that in. Nothing for a hyena to chew. And as I said, now you've got some... Oh, there we go. I'm going to put the piece of bark back over where it was. Let me just try to get some light on it for you there. There we go. I'm just... Oh, no. Such a pity. Uh, it's another moth egg casing, but again, the little wasps have opened it up and eaten and have eaten the inside of that. Now we've seen that in quite a few of these egg casings we found recently, that the moths have managed to find these little moth larvae and eat them before they're able to emerge. Okay, let's put this back over there. Also. All right. Okay, so I'm going to take you where and why I've chosen this particular spot, but we do need to do a bit of grooming first. It's just, oh, okay, I'm going to move. Now that I'm in front of the camera, I can see a bit better as well. Let's just move some of these little tentacles out the way. Push it back like that so it looks a bit further down. Here we go. Good camera. Catch me some, catch me some honey badgers or serval. Oh, I nearly lost my, all right. There we go. Thank you very much, Herbie. I can't carry on my walk without my stick. So you're going to see now the reason that I've chosen this particular area. Now you can see how massive this, this path is. So it's going to be utilized by lots of different creatures. And hopefully some of the little nocturnal carnivores as well. Now, you always got to be careful when coming through an area like this. Especially now that the day is becoming a bit warmer. There's always a chance of those big grumpy buffalo bulls making their way through. You can always stop, look, listen. It sounds safe. Oh, Chandra. Orange breasted bush ride. Just gonna keep very still for now. I, I, it, it, I'm hoping it moves out of that really bad light, but it hasn't spotted us yet. It's one of the most beautiful birds you get on Juma. Just fly that way a little bit. So it's just in really bad light at the moment. How's it looking, John? there? It's blown off. Okay, I'm hoping it, just, it should flop off to either side. Incredibly beautiful bird. Part of a bigger bird party. Oh, he's, come on, hop, hop to the right, into the good light. A little bit more, one more tree across. Just the most striking bird. It hasn't noticed that, so we're keeping very still. Very distinct call as well. Before we've got to the water hole, there's this wonderful little bird party around it. If you see the woodpecker as well as Andre, if you look up just to the left of the bush right, little cardinal woodpecker. Sounds like there's a couple of them. Just really waiting for them to fly to a slightly better spot from the sunlight. There's the little woodpecker. Oh, he's going at it. Okay, the, the bush right's moved, Chandra, so let's just take one or two steps and we should be able to get it in better light. Yeah. 
So you see that nice bend in the tree there? It's just beyond. Oh, there we go. So if we come here, so this fallen down Combretum, it's jumping into the little thorny thicket to the left of it. You should just get that bright orange flash every now and then. Putting you to the test this morning, John. Right Find it? And I, we just want that thing to turn towards us and show us that incredible chest. There we go. Look at that. Isn't that just spectacular, that little bird? One of the birds we hear more, a lot calling, but we don't often see. That was spectacular. So let's carry on. Now, again, explaining why I chose this area. Andre, you're going to come here. Um, if we follow this little path forward, there we go, you see it hopping along the ground. Okay, come where I am. Frolicking along the ground there. You got him. And a white browed scrub robin. Okay, there we go, you can see it. Now, it's one of the more drab of the robin species has definitely got one of the most beautiful calls. Now, I'm not going to try and imitate it. My, you're going to have to ask James to whistle his call for you because it is spectacular. And they're quite often skulking. It's, it's really nice to catch one out in the open. They're normally just doing the disappearing act. Okay, well, we get we're sidetracked by the bird. But as I'm saying, as you can see here, there's a little river system down to the to the right of me and um, there's water here and you can just see how well used this area is by most multiple species of animals now dory is wondering what we got last time well we got porcupine scrub hair jennet uh impala buffalo uh, dwarf mongoose lots of doves but i'm pretty sure we'll oh and civet as well i'm pretty sure we're going to get civet and jennet again here but we might also get lions, they've been using this area quite often. Leopard, you never know. But as you can see, we've now come out to the Gallego Pan. And I can't see any sign of buffalo coming through, but I know Jamie had lions here this morning. So just being a little bit careful as we come through, especially as it heats up during the day, a lot of your bigger animals like buffalo and elephant are going to move towards these water holes for a drink. Okay, so I'm very excited about this camera trap. It's far from a road, so it's unlikely we're going to get any vehicles. And then it must seem like an age ago we asked you about a track in the sand. And well done to Michael, James, and Sarah, uh, who said Art Fark. Oh, yeah, so hopefully we catch lots of fantastic creatures on that camera trap. I'm quite excited. I hope you guys are too. I will start sharing some of the camera trap, uh, the last camera setting of the camera trap. Uh, but for now, uh, we're going to start slowly moving home. Fortunately for us, it's not too long a walk. And we'll go set off the camera trap to be the first creatures on it. Uh, but uh, from myself, Jandre and Herbie, it's been wonderful having you on the Sunrise Safaris bushwalk. And we'll see you again in a few short hours for the Sunset Safaris. So toodles for now. Yes, please. Hey, and well done to VM for Spotigo. We've been circling this block in the slowest possible way. You are responsible for those alarm calls. You scared all the animals. Shadow is there. This is so awesome. What a wonderful way to finish off our morning. Lions, elephants, wild dogs. Oh, Shadow's on the move. We better go quickly. Oh, no, not through this stuff. Stuff, Scotty Via. Yes. Our at 
utterly marvelous. One very round bellied shadow. Just want to check very carefully that um, her little one isn't with her. I don't think so, but sometimes she leaves her behind on the termite mound. I don't want to scare her. No, I don't think so. We would have seen by now. And if we don't move, we are going to lose her. We are just to the east of Triple M. She's moved through into the block between uh, Zoe's and Triple M. South of the Nighties Junction, going towards the Gauri Repeater. Oh, my goodness. Oh, it's a stump. I thought it was a leopard cup. What an awesome way. We knew something was happening here. It was just a matter of figuring out what. Oh, everybody duck. Watch your heads. Watch your feet, watch your arms, watch your legs, watch all extremities. We are going through the monkey orange thicket. Actually, I say shadow, you know. I'm working on an assumption here. You've got to be careful of that. Just in terms of where she is, it's, it's the western boundary of Karula's territory. Let us double check this first. There's definitely no scampering cub. But she might be on her way to fetch it. So we've got to proceed with caution. Which way are you going to go, girl? Let's try to get ahead of her this way. It's definitely Shadow. There's just something about Shadow's body language that is very easily identifiable. Oh, and she's changed direction. She's going back towards Triple M. Sorry, everybody. Hold on. Oh, she's stopping to look. New viewers, just a little bit of a, an update on the way in which we work and the way in which we do things when we go off-road. We pick the tree species that are either encroacher species or resilient and pop back up. So we drive over young saplings or dead trees. Hello. She's, I think she's calling. Let's just wait and see. way to continue our morning. It really has been a beautiful day here. She's sniffing the ground. I think she might have left her cub here. She's not... At first I thought she was calling. She's not. The picture of elegance. I think she's hunting. She looks quite full-bellied to me. There's that twitchy tail. It sticks out so clearly when you're watching a leopard. Such a cool morning. So many things have just gone right this morning. It's awesome. There's nothing like a, a surprise leopard. everybody. And while we sneak through here and figure out where Shadow's going, Michael wants to know if our leopards ever hunt monkeys or baboons in this area in the way that they do in other places. Yes, they absolutely do. The last or the second to last time that I saw Shadow with her cub, she had a monkey carcass. The little baby was chewing on the monkey's head. Karula's been known to catch monkeys before. And Kunuma has caught a baboon. 
yes, absolutely, our leopards are. That's one of the reasons why monkeys go so incredibly frantic when they see leopards. They know that it's one of the few animals, apart from birds of prey, that are threats to them. And that would be capable of catching them in the trees that they climb in. Only animal agile enough. And monkeys and, oh sorry, baboons and leopards, even more so. And baboons and leopards have been known to have out and out wars with each other because a big male baboon is about half the size of a female leopard or half the size and weight of a female leopard. However, she's gonna, I'm sure she's going to go straight towards that termite mound. However, there are lots of big male baboons in a troop and they have been known on occasion to come to blows with leopards of an area. I was just about to pick up my game drive comms. I haven't had a chance to call us in or establish which way she's going. Up she goes onto the termite mound. Let's catch up with her. no better picture than a leopard on a termite mound in the morning sunlight. The station's one Mufuzi Ingwe to the south of Balanites between Zoe's and Triple M. Approaching the repeater but we're in some thick bush here. As soon as I get to exactly where we are I'll keep you updated. She's mobile north. surveying the area. These termite mounds are so, so useful, which is why we so often see our leopards moving up onto one, just because it gives them a vantage point over the area that they're in, a chance to look for any prey. She's not in luck, though. I don't think it was her calling, causing the alarm calls, because she's come straight back to the area where we first had them, and all of the animals have disappeared from here. Let's go around the other side, get her in the morning light. Hmm. I say that. Not as, not as easy to do without driving right into her personal space, which I don't want to do. should be relatively easy to do once we just get past these bushes. No, it's not going to be as easy as I thought. I'm going to send you across to Mr. Hendry while we reposition so that he can say his farewells and then we will catch up with you very shortly with Shadow. I'm trying to point out some dwarf mongoose to my friend Zunder over here. Can you see them? There he's got them now, everybody. There we go. Dwarf mongoose, shadow, wild dogs, elephants, lions. What a morning it has been. And just a reward to Jamie for the tireless efforts she's put in this morning to have found shadow. Brilliant stuff. Young male leopard tracks around here as well, so perhaps Sindile is also around. James Richard, it is also your birthday and my father's birthday. It is our pleasure to have found you all these animals for your birthday. Um, I'm going to say goodbye to you now, um, and we will take a, well, we'll see you this afternoon. A big thank you to Zunder for his efforts today. A big thank you to the universe for its great manifold blessings upon us, and we'll see you this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Until then, happy birthday, James and Dad, and we'll see you later. Bye-bye. What better birthday drive than to spend some time with our female leopard who's now marking her territory on the Maruda tree, unfortunately in a very awkward position. Let's just try and get around her. Oh, this is stick the drongos, sorry, have just spotted her. Chuk, 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 alarm calling. The signs of the bush are all there if you know what to listen for and what to look for. I'm 
desperate to keep up with her because I want to know where she's going. She's not as full as I thought she was. I made a mistake. She's actually not that full. She's quite hungry. It looked like she had a full belly, but I think that's just because she's become a little bit like Karula, which often happens to older leopards. After several litters of cubs, they get a bit floppy around the belly. Which is why at first, she thought, at first I thought she was full, but she's not. She's going to go up the termite mound again. Is she? Oh, goodness. Where's her head going to pop up? Other side. <laughs> she had me fooled. Ah, uh, yes, I see. There's a tail there. Shadow has a young cub that is even younger than Karula's cubs. And Rena would like to know how old her cub is now. Well, we never knew the exact age of Shadow's cub. We know that it's about a month younger than Karula's cubs. But it might even be less than that. But I would say that Shadow's cub is probably about five months old now, just judging from her size. And exactly... Exactly when we first started, or the guides actually, we didn't, but when the guides first started seeing her. So she's about a month younger than Karula's cubs. We were so lucky with Karula's cubs, because of course we knew the exact date of birth. We were there when they were only a couple of hours old. Wonderful to hear from dispatch saying this is a first sighting of the lovely shadow. I'm glad to hear that dispatch. It is one of these moments is truly thrilling to get to spend time with the characters that we do. So dispatch and many other new viewers like to introduce you to Shadow, the female leopard and daughter of Karula, who has now changed her mind completely true to form and much like her mom, changed her mind about which direction she's going in. She's busy patrolling her territorial boundary as well, making sure she sent marks. The station's the Smofuzzy Ingra is now mobile back towards Triple M. She's going to cross close to the Balanites Junction. Which way are you going, girl? The shadow's had an interesting time. Because she's being pushed out of her territory by... Our live safaris right up until the last moment. And we are reaching the end of our show. It's almost time for us to say goodbye. Shadow is almost on Arethusa. She's back on the main road once again. I'm going to... I'm going to have to say goodbye. A big thank you to Viam for all of his fantastic camera work and also branch dodging, as well as to Rebecca and to Jerry in Final Control. And most importantly, a big thank you and a shout out to all of you watching across the globe. It's been wonderful having you. And it's time for us to say goodbye. <laughs>